Hi. I think we're going to start in uh, about right now. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, thank you to the Center for Programs and Contemporary Writing for sponsoring tonight's event. It's a real honor for me to be able to introduce Ben Lerner. Lerner is the author of three books of poetry, The Lichtenberg Figures, Engel of Yaw, and Mean Free Path. He has been a finalist for the National Book Award in Poetry and the Northern California Book Award, a Fulbright Scholar in Spain, and a Howard Foundation Fellow. His first novel, Leaving the Atocha Station, won the Believer Book Award and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award for First Fiction and the New York Public Library's Young Lions Award. It was named one of the best books of the year by The New Yorker, The Guardian, The New Statesman, The Boston Globe, The Wall Street Journal, The New Republic, and New York Magazine, among others. After reading Leaving the Atocha Station, it's a little bit terrifying to attempt to say anything remotely intelligent about Lerner's work. The novel is narrated by Adam Gordon, a young poet spending a year in Spain on a fellowship, and Lerner captures what we might call the relentless bullshit of literary culture, better than just about any writer I've ever read, and that at one point Adam imagines beating his clueless introducer's face in with a microphone or lamp doesn't help my anxiety about <laughs> sounding full of shit tonight. <laughs> This isn't to say that Adam is a man of rage or action. More than anything, he's a man of anxiety. And as he's waiting for his turn to read his poems, what finally allows him to relax, that is, other than his tranquilizers, is the thought that poetry is no longer possible, that it's, as Adam reflects, a dead medium whose former power could be felt only as a loss. In that context, a terrible poem suddenly becomes an accomplishment, as Adam sees it. The more abysmal the experience of the actual, the greater the implied heights of the virtual. With that in mind, I'd like to suggest that introductions are as impossible as poems, and that my words tonight should be understood only as a sort of negative reminder of what an introduction could be. I'd also like to suggest that Ben Lerner has written one of the best novels in recent years, a novel that somehow manages to bring theory and comedy together on almost every page, a novel that manages to feel Seinfeld-esque, both in its humor and in its interest in the nothingness of daily life, while taking on the hardest questions about art. Imagine Larry David editing the literary section of The New Republic, and you perhaps start to get the idea. In a short essay about the writing of the book, Lerner, Lerner noted that he came to write the novel by working against an image of the conventional novel, by writing his resistance to the form into the form. And that resistance is surely felt, but in my reading at least, the great success and paradox of the book is that it's precisely the resistance to the conventions of the form that allow a learner to achieve the central aim of the conventional novel, that is, the creation of a wholly unique character in whom we can't help but see ourselves. The more learner ignores plot and allows Adam's neuroses to carry us through his mostly uneventful year, the more universal Adam somehow becomes. Identifying with Adam Gordon, of course, isn't always fun. Adam's relatable not only because he's so scared, but also because he's a total fraud, a painful, if necessary, reminder that we're all constantly faking it or at least it would be painful if it weren't so damn funny. In one of my favorite passages, Gordon describes a very specific eyebrow-raised face he has perfected for parties. As Gordon puts it, it's a look that communicated incredulity cut with familiarity, a boredom arrested only by a vaguely anthropological interest in my surroundings, a look that contained a dose of contempt I hoped could be read as political, as insinuating that after a frivolous night, I would be returning to the front lines. This particular worry, like many of Adam's worries, is about women. But Adam's deepest anxiety is that he's a fraud as an artist, that he's incapable not only of creating art, but of even experiencing it. Insofar as I was interested in the arts, Adam reflects, I was interested in the disconnect between my experience of actual artworks and the claims made on their behalf. The closest I'd come to having a profound experience of art was probably the experience of this distance, a profound experience of the absence of profundity. I suspect that almost all readers will identify with Adam's dilemma. I certainly do. But this is another of the great tricks of the novel, a trick that Lerner also employs in his poems that wrestle with the same dilemma. In articulating so perfectly the distance between what we want to experience from art and what we do experience, Lerner closes the very gap he describes. Ben Lerner is the rare artist whose work is truly as exhilarating as the claims made on its behalf. Please join me in welcoming. Um, thank you very much, 
for the introduction and for having me. Um, is this okay? Is this the right volume, more or less? In the novel, when he when he threatens to when he thinks when he fantasizes about beating the guy who's introduced him, it's because he's been tricked into reading. But I was in, I was invited, <laughs> um, and I'm I'm really I'm grateful to have been invited. This is a new poem called Index of Themes. Poems about night and related poems. Paintings about night, sleep, death and the stars. I know one poem from school under the stars, but belong to no school of poetry. I forgot it by heart. I remember only it was set in the world and its theme parted. Poems about stars and how they are erased by street lights, streets in a poem about force in the schools within it. We learned all about night in college, how it applies. Night college under the stars where we made love a subject. I completed my study of form and forgot it. Tonight, poems about summer and the stars are sorted by era over me. Also poems about grief and dance. I thought I'd come to you with these themes like my senses. Do you remember me from the world? I was set there and we spoke on the green, likening something to prison, something to film. Poems about dreams like moths about street lights until the cliches glow. Soft glow of the screen comes off on our hands, blueprints on the windows. How pretentious to be alive now, let alone again, like poetry and poems indexed by cadences falling about us while parting. It was important to part yesterday in a serial work about lights so that distance could enter the voice and address you tonight. Poems about you, prose poems. I want to um, read for a little bit from, from Leaving the Atocha Station. I mean, Sam talked about, really eloquently, about the narrator and his organizing anxieties. And this is, this is from late in the book when um, there have been the bombings at the Atocha Station, and there's been a uh, a, a, the socialists have basically been elected in part as a protest to the to the popular party, to the government who was in power and who had lied um, about the attackers. They had said it was all, they they had implied that they were um, Basque separatists, and because that would have benefited them electorally. Um, and so there was a huge change in, in in the direction of the election, and the socialists won. And now. The, uh, the narrator of the novel finds himself going to a fancy party with people celebrating that victory. Um, this is a section that's kind of, I mean, there'll be plenty of references to other moments in the novel that won't make any sense, but I, I hope it'll make a kind of sense as I go. The socialists won. The American media were furious, claiming the Spanish had been intimidated by terrorism. Outside, I heard people cheering. A little before 10, the buzzer rang, and I went downstairs, and Teresa was there. She kissed me on the lips, and I felt in love with her. We walked together to the car where Arturo was waiting. It took us a long time to get beyond the city. Arturo talked to Teresa the whole drive, something about how Pedro Almodovar had said on TV that the PP was planning a coup, but I might have misunderstood. When we finally arrived at Rafa's expansive house, I asked how Rafa made his money. They laughed. I said, I meant, how did his family make its money? Teresa said something about banks. And your own family, I asked tentatively. Arturo said they didn't make it by writing poetry, and we laughed. Then Teresa said she had told me already, didn't I remember? I hesitated and said, yes, I remember now. She might have told me the first night I met her, or she might have told me at various points and I failed to understand her Spanish, or she might have been lying about having told me. We went inside. Beautiful people were there again, a few of whom I recognized from the gallery or Teresa's apartment. Everything was a little changed, a little charged. 
For whatever reason, I thought again of the photographs of Teresa's distant family. I didn't know how to compose my face if indifference tinged with vague disdain was still the right expression. If I could have smiled Teresa's inscrutable smile, I would have. One of the paintings was covered with black felt. It didn't look like a covered painting from the 19th century. It looked like contemporary art. People were talking about politics or everything seemed suddenly political. I overheard conversation about the role of photography now, where now meant post-March 11th. A post was being formed, and the air was alive less with the excitement of a period than with the excitement of periodization. I heard something about how the cell phone, instrumental to organizing the marches, was the dominant political technology of the age. What about titadine, the form of compressed dynamite used in the attacks, I wanted to say? Wasn't that the dominant technology? I said this to Teresa, who corrected me gently as we poured ourselves drinks. These attacks were made for TV. She said the phrase in English. I meant to pour myself gin, but when I tried it, I discovered it was silver tequila. At 17, I had made myself violently ill drinking tequila and had never had it again, except to taste it every couple of years to see if it still disgusted me, which it always did. I thought back to that night in Topeka, vomiting for an hour near a bonfire and then sleeping in the bed of a pickup in the middle of the winter. I could smell the campfire and felt cold and a little dizzy. Then I thought of Cyrus trying to wash the taste out of his mouth. Teresa took the drink from me and handed me a fresh one, a vodka tonic, which smelled clean. You don't want tequila, she said, as though she knew what I was remembering, as though we had known each other for many years. I was becoming almost frightened of her grace and gifts of anticipation. I worried that I would not be able to lie to her, and I worried not for the first time that whenever I'd thought I'd successfully lied to her, she had in fact easily seen through me. If I were forced to rely on only the literal truth, she would soon grow tired of me. I thought I would attempt to preempt or slow the situation by naming it, and as we walked out back with our drinks, I said to her in English, you were the most graceful and protean person I know, the way you handed me the coffee right when I awoke, or the way just now you took the tequila from me, or I paused to think of an example not involving drinks, the way you can move without apparent transition from your stylish apartment to a protest. Why do you keep speaking to me in English, she asked with something like concern. I ignored the question and went on. But I'm worried you're too cool for me, that you'll realize I'm in fact a fraud, an inelegant fraud. I won't be able to fool you and you'll get bored. As I said this, I thought it would be impossible to hide my pills from her. I had a sudden involuntary memory of the Ritz. All you're describing, she said in Spanish, is the personality of a translator from apartment to protest from English to Spanish. If she had spoken in English, I would have found it a little grand. In Spanish, I experienced it as profound. I wondered if she'd weighed the sentence in both languages before selecting the one that would produce the desired effect. Teresa started to remove her clothes, and for a second I thought she had lost her mind. But she had a swimsuit on underneath, and she left her clothes in a little pile and slipped noiselessly into the heated, lighted pool, as if to punctuate the ease with which she could move between media. There were a few other people in the pool, all of them women, all of whom appeared to know Teresa. I found a nearby patio chair and lit a cigarette, reiterating to myself my promise that I would never smoke another cigarette once I left Madrid, but that until then I gave myself permission to smoke without guilt. This little psychological mechanism, as crucial to my smoking as lighter or match, reminded me of Arturo's comment about staying in Spain. I saw Teresa dive underwater and thought, why wouldn't I stay? I could make enough money teaching English to keep the same apartment. Maybe Arturo would pay me to work at the gallery in some capacity. Maybe my parents would send me money. Or maybe Teresa would support me. I would write and she would translate and we would walk through El Retiro at dusk. I imagined people visiting from the US, imagined their amazement and envy at the life I had made for myself. How long would I stay beyond the fellowship, I wondered, maybe another year? I would make myself really learn Spanish, which seemed dimly possible now, and I would also begin to translate Teresa's poems into English. I would publish a book of poems and then a book of translations, and I would come home, perhaps with Teresa, as a celebrated author imbued with Iberian mystery. Or would I never go home except to visit? 
I finished my drink and went to the bar for another, and there was the man who had argued with Abel after my reading, the man who believed the disjunction of my poetry was a radical political gesture. He recognized me, but he misremembered our conversation. Do you still believe that poetry can change the world, he asked me. I paused. It can exacerbate the world's contradictions, I said, mumbling the verb I didn't really know. Well, it's not poetry that makes things happen, he said. Poetry makes nothing happen, I said in English. He blinked at me. What made all of this, I said in Spanish, waving my hand to include the party in the events of the last few days, happen? Bodies in the streets, he said. At first I thought he meant dead bodies, then I realized he meant the bodies of protesters. I tried to describe that confusion, the two ways one could understand his answer, but I garbled the Spanish and abandoned the thought. I went back outside and sat in the same chair and drank my drink. Teresa was no longer in the pool and I looked around for her but couldn't see her. When my drink was finished, I fixed another, this time at the little outside bar, and then I walked beyond the pool toward the softly lit garden where I had once heard Rafa sing. When I encountered Teresa sitting on the stone bench kissing Carlos, my jealousy and rage felt like solid things, things formed over many years, so it seemed like they preceded their cause, were detached from the scene. It was a while before I noticed two of the other swimmers nearby, maybe five feet from the bench, faint glow of white towels sharing a joint. I sat down beside them, and one of them passed me the joint, saying something like, here is the poet. Teresa had stopped kissing or letting herself be kissed by the man who I now saw was not Carlos, was another handsome man I didn't know. She had noticed me entirely without concern. I considered getting up and storming off to the edge of the property overlooking the hill where I had told Teresa my mother was dead. I imagined striking the man who was walking back to the party now repeatedly in the face. The joint was before me again and the woman who passed it began to speak to me and either because I was high or upset I couldn't understand her Spanish, but that's not really right. Her Spanish, like Teresa's poem, became a repository for whatever meaning I assigned it, and I felt I understood, although I knew I was talking to myself. It was as if she said, think about the necklace. Think about the making of the necklace, about Isabel's brother's notebook. I could hear what she was actually saying beneath this, and I heard myself respond, but all of that was very distant. It was as if she said, imagine her brother writing. Think of the little scrap of paper Teresa tore from her novel and put into your notebook. Think of the hash transported inside one body as a solid and expelled and sold and then drawn into your body as vapor and gas. Think of the bombers purchasing the backpacks. Always think of the objects. Think of the necklaces and novels and bodies torn apart by the blast. Think of the making of the necklaces and the novels and the bodies and Isabel's brother in the crushed red car. But then think of a poster of Michael Jordan on the wall of Isabel's brother's room while he wrote the years down in the notebook. Where is that poster now? And think of the field opposite the telephone pole her brother wrapped the car around, how you can turn your attention away from the crushed red car and his body and walk into the field where nothing is happening, just indifferent wind and the indifferent grass, but a particular wind and particular grass. You can stay there for as long as you want, easily blocking out the sirens. Or you can enter the poster with the sea of camera flashes as Michael Jordan jumps and you can leave the arena as the crowd is roaring and walk into the Chicago of the recent past where novels are being written and necklaces are being made and gases are being inhaled and dates are being memorized by brains and brains destroyed in crashes. You can see all of this from a great height and zoom out until it is no longer visible or you can zoom in on the writing hand or the face of the dead, zoom in until it's no longer a face, or you can click on something and drag it. You can adjust the color, or you can make it black and white. You can view any object from any angle or multiple angles simultaneously, or you can shut your eyes and listen to the crowd and the arena or the silence slowly approaching the red car or the sound of the pen writing down the years as silver is hammered in shape. Teresa had sat down beside us and lit another joint and passed it to me and asked me something and I heard myself respond, but all that was very distant and what I heard her whispering was something like, 
to join lips to express affection, or as part of insufflation, to click the teeth while making love, or trying to form a seal between your mouth and the victim's, or to place the tongue between your teeth, to pronounce the Z of Zalakayin, or to place a tooth beneath the pillow or the bracelet made of baby teeth her grandma had to attempt to move from one language into another without rotation or angular displacement and to fail in that attempt and call your father from a payphone weeping or to weep before a painting so one can think of payphones and of paintings as the same. Now I realize Teresa wasn't speaking but was humming and playing with my hair, but still I heard to embrace the tragic interchangeability of nouns and smile inscrutably or to find a way of touching down, albeit momentarily, and be made visible by swirling condensation and debris, and to know that one pole of experience is always caught up in the other, but to know this finely in your body, cone of heat unfurling, to take everything personally until your person personality dissolves and you can move without transition from apartment to protest or distribute yourself among a shifting configuration of bodies, saying yes to everything, affirming nothing, your own body giving up its shape in a gesture that expresses that shape. Then I was on my back and Teresa was on her back beside me and all of the jealousy was gone or so far away I no longer thought of it as mine. I could see a particularly bright star that I then saw as a satellite, but ultimately I knew it was a plane. Um, this is a very new poem called Contre Jour, which you know is that is that effect like in photography when you photograph someone or something against a light source. Um, and so the, the intensity of the illumination behind the thing you're photographing kind of blocks out the details of the, of the subject, if that makes sense. I don't know if it matters, if it makes sense, but this poem is, is for John Berger. The light that changes, the light that goes out when you pass under it, the unsafe intersection and the ghost bike, the light that turns out to be a flame and the bulb designed to flicker, Obviously, city lights, the necklace lights of bridges, lights of planes are part of this, especially flashing or extinguished. Trick candle sparking in the cake, little star sparking, winter green in the mouth, the speech of it decaying, flash of the muzzles as they chased Victor Serge across the rooftop. The snow blue in the light and the burning manuscripts in Paris, the city of the light that changes in the mouth. I wish I'd known you were a fan of light. I would have saved some for you. Moonlight on pavement set aside for you in factories, in prisons, obviously, in Moscow, burning, obviously, in the throat. I left a light on for you, Victor Serge, in the last century, century of last cigarettes, the light decay gives off the cold light of the living organism and the open seas in Oakland, some old paintings. Because like ash, it scatters, I thought that I might sing. Because it dies repeatedly in Mexico, penniless, penniless in Spain, I thought that I might speak openly with you in photographs. If I appear, then obviously I'm penniless because appearance is the last resort of light. Victor Serge, in his letters, in translation, our liquidation has been prepared, and if they call your name, my hands are tied. My role is limited to passing through glass, to letting the glass bend light around small corners and translucent wings. Espejitos is its Spanish name, but Spain was lost. Little mirrors whose borders are opaque. Can I just say one thing? about how everything is lost, one obvious thing about the threat of sky glow and the need for dark oases, and could Serge be sighted traveling at a constant speed through opaque objects like these pages, or would that be singing? Because like ash, when you pass under it, 
because like snow blue systems. I wrote an, a second novel Acc accidentally. Uh, uh, at the, um, and I thought I would read like just six six paragraphs from it. That I read the, the epigraph to the book, and then and then just read six paragraphs from it, and not not try to describe it beyond that. So this is the epigraph, which is which I first found in in the. Um, it's in that Giorgio Gammon book, The Coming Community, but it's attributed to Walter. I think, it's, I think the idea is that Sholem told it to Walter Benjamin, but I, I think it's debated. And anyway, it's an old, the epigraph's an old story that has this kind of complicated history. But here, here's the epigraph. The Hasidim tell a story about the world to come that says everything there will be just as it is here. Just as our room is now, so it will be in the world to come. Where our baby sleeps now, there too it will sleep in the other world. And the clothes we wear in this world, those too we will wear there. Everything will be as it is now, just a little different. From a million media, most of them handheld, awareness of the storm seeped into the city entering the architecture and the stout-bodied passerines, inflecting traffic patterns in the improved sycamores, so-called because they're hybridized for urban living. I mean the city was becoming one organism, constituting itself in relation to a threat viewable from space, an aerial sea monster with a single centered eye around which tentacular rain bands swirled. There were myriad apps to track it, the Doppler color-coded to indicate the intensity of precipitation, the same technology they'd utilized to measure the velocity of blood flow through my arteries. Because every conversation you overheard in line or on the street or train began to share a theme, it was soon one common conversation you could join, removing the conventional partitions from social space. Riding the end train to Whole Foods in Union Square, I found myself swapping surge level predictions with a Hasidic Jew and a West Indian nurse in purple scrubs. At Canal Street, the three of us were joined by a teenager whose body seemed smaller than the cello case strapped to her back. She explained that the doomsday hype was designed to evacuate Lower Manhattan so police could install bugs and other listening devices in every apartment. We stopped talking when a mariachi band comprised of three men in their 20s, one of whom wore embroidered straight-cut muslin pants, struck up Toda Una Vida. It was hard to tell if they played particularly well or if we passengers were, in the glow of our increasing sociability, particularly disposed to appreciate them or music generally. Regardless, there was an unusual quantity of pathos in the song, applause, than an unusual quantity of currency in the hat. Emerging from the train, I found it was fully night, the air excited by foreboding and something else, something like the feel of a childhood snow day when time was emancipated from institutions, when the snow seemed like a technology for defeating time or like defeated time itself falling from the sky, each glittering ice particle an instant gifted back from your routine. Except now the material form of excitation wasn't ice. The air around Union Square was heavy with water in its gas phase, a tropical humidity that wasn't native to New York, an ominous medium. In front of the Whole Foods where Alex told me to meet her, it was a preposterous idea to shop at Whole Foods, given that it was always already mobbed, but they were the sole carrier of a tea on which Alex claimed to be dependent, one of her few indulgences. A reporter bathed in tungsten light was talking to a camera about a run on flashlights, canned food, bottled water. Children were darting back and forth behind her, stopping now and then to wave. Alex greeted me, and I noted to myself a difference in her appearance, an unspecifiable radiance. But as we began to push our way as gently as possible through the crowds, I realized the alteration was most likely in my vision, because everything remaining on the shelves also struck me as a little changed, a little charged. 
The relative scarcity was strange to behold. In what were typically bright aisles of superabundance, there were now large empty spaces, especially among prepackaged staples, although plenty of outrageously priced organic produce still glistened in the artificial mist. Alex had some kind of list, storm radio, hand crank flashlight, candles, various foodstuffs. They were out of almost everything on it at this point. We didn't care and circulated through the vast store on the current of other shoppers, shoppers who seemed unusually polite and cheerful despite the presence of police near the registers. I want to say I felt stoned, did say so to Alex, who laughed and said, me too. But what I meant was that the approaching storm was estranging the routine of shopping, just enough to make me viscerally aware of both the miracle and, and insanity of the mundane economy. Finally, I found something on the list, something vital, instant coffee. I held the red plastic container, one of the last three on the shelf, held it like the marvel that it was. The seeds inside the purple fruits of coffee plants had been harvested on Andean slopes and roasted in ground and soaked and then dehydrated at a factory in Medellin and vacuum sealed and flown to JFK and then driven upstate in bulk to Pearl River for repackaging and then transported back by truck to the store where I now stood reading the label. It was as if the social relations that produced the object in my hand began to glow within it as they were threatened, stirred inside their packaging, lending it a certain aura, the majesty and murderous stupidity of that organization of time and space and fuel and labor becoming visible in the commodity itself now that planes were grounded and the highways were starting to close. Everything will be as it is now, just a little different. Nothing in me or the store had changed except maybe my aorta, but as the eye drew near, what normally felt like the only possible world became one among many, its meaning everywhere up for grabs, however briefly, and the passing commons of a train in a container of tasteless coffee. I'll end with this, with this short poem, which is also very new. Um, there are these, I'm working on this manuscript, and most of the poems are very dark and actually interested in darkness, but I guess I'm, I'm reading a few that, are, that have light in them. Um, but this is called No, no Art. Tonight I can't remember why everything is permitted or what amounts to the same thing forbidden. No art is total, even theirs, even though it raises towers or kills from the air. There's too much piety in despair as if the silver leaves behind the glass were politics and the wind they move in and the chance of scattered storms. Those are still my ways of making, and I know that I can call on you until you're real enough to turn from. Maybe I have fallen behind, am falling, but I think of myself as having people, a small people in a failed state, and love more avant-garde than shame or the easy distances. All my people are with me now the way the light is. Thank you. Thank you again to Ben Lerner. We have a few minutes for questions now. Is there a microphone? Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been told at one point or another in different renditions that you're supposed to write about what you know. Um, and reading your book, it seems like the only thing that you can really know is the fact that you don't understand fully or, or the absence of knowing completely. Um, not to conflict you with the character in the book, but how much does that idea of not knowing uh, do you think is your own ideas? Um, is that, yeah, is yeah, that yeah, understandable? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've never understood. I've never understood the right what you know 
thing. I mean, for me, the uh, I mean, that was a very elegant question is about how not knowing can be the basis of a kind of inquiry, which is, I mean, and I guess is really the Socratic tradition, right? The, um, but uh, for me, it, it's what you discover in the act of composition, like that thing that isn't exactly knowledge, but whatever is produced out of the kind of push and pull of language. You think you have, you think you have something to say, or you hear something in the language, or you're influenced by something you can't pin down. I mean, I have a territory of concern when I write, I guess, although even that I often have to discover. Um, so, I mean, I would say that the, it, like on the, in, the, in a certain sense, on the, on the kind of level of content, I'm certainly sympathetic to Adam Gordon's idea that what's frustrating and enticing about the arts is the impossibility of ever producing an artifact that wouldn't in some sense betray the abstract potential of the medium, that there's something kind of, I mean, there's a way you can describe that as kind of religious, or there's a way that you can describe that as um, political, like how can you make something that could gesture towards an outside to a political system that feels increasingly total, and it's kind of the way the artwork fails that becomes a figure um, for what it can't actually embody. So I mean, I'm very sympathetic to that idea, but the right, the right what you know thing seems to me like a recipe for disaster. I mean, I, I, can, I can imagine context in which that's good advice, but I can't imagine interesting writing that really is about finding a container for knowledge you possessed previous to the act of, of writing, um, if, that makes, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I was particularly struck from the passage that you read from the book. Uh, what those of us without books probably missed was that there's um, one of the few images inserted like, uh, say, two-thirds of the way through that passage. Um, and I was wondering uh, what, what thoughts you had when you were deciding to include images. There are only like five or six in the whole novel, um, especially given that the novel begins in a gallery staring at not only the image, but someone looking at an image. Right. Um, so what thoughts did you have in deciding um, to include images? And would they be similar to what Adam Gordon thinks about the image? But for the first question, mostly. <laughs> um, well, maybe, I mean, so it's not clear. I th I th it's not clear if Adam Gordon is aware of the images in the book. And they often tend to be images of things he doesn't see, like the image of the Alhambra. So they're kind of not illustrative exactly. And part of what interested me about images is how they were in this kind of ambiguous space in the world of the story, right? Like are they, are they images that the historical author has chosen and used as a structuring device? Are they images that he's collected? So they're gestures that you understand as internal to his personality. So, so um, I don't know the answer to the second question, but that, that's a question that I would like the use of images to pose. And the, um, I mean, for me, one, you know, there's this whole, there's this tradition of, of, of like one traditional ob objective of, of fiction, right, as a kind of discourse of realism is to make you see, like Conrad was always talking about making you see, and I'm not very interested in that. And one of the things I like about, I mean, it doesn't mean that there aren't books in which I'm really, it doesn't mean I don't care about description, but it just means that I don't, I don't like the idea that the book makes you forget um, forget what you're reading in order to be able to see something behind it. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm finding my, it's hard for me to describe this because normally I would use language that Ron uses in a famous essay and now I'm trying to not use it and I suddenly find myself without, without vocabulary. But that, what, you, what you call the optical realism, right? This idea that you're kind of supposed to forget that you're reading in order to believe that you have a window on reality. That's never been that interesting to me. And the thing about images is that even a very uh, low quality image or a grainy photograph for me tends to have such a surfeit of visual information that once it's in the context of prose, it kind of relieves this pressure of realistic description on the, on the rest of the prose. That is to say that it, I, I kind of, I become interested in what prose can do that the photographs can't. So it both relieves a pressure of a kind of realistic description, and it also produces this new pressure, which is, well, what does, what does text do in relation to an image? Um, 
I mean, I guess that it's not to, it's not totally dissimilar to like a discourse that's very robust in the visual arts about like the relation between you know what what happened to painting, what happened to figurative painting with the advent of the photograph. But I don't, I've never been around that discussion with the with the novel. But a lot of my favorite r prose writers do use images. You know, Zebald or Javier Marias in a kind of different way. Um, yeah, those those are my first thoughts about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in an interview that I read uh, that you did for The Believer, you talked about how um, painting reacted to the invention of photography and that you didn't see a lot of that in writing, that it hasn't reacted to uh, the advent of different art forms um, because of technology. Um, in your own projects, how do you react to, to what you see a lack of in the writing world? Well, I mean, my... I guess what, what I, I think what I meant in talking about the related to the kind of text and image stuff was just like, you know, we, we definitely live in a cu culture that's saturated by images. And one of the contemporary things I think a novel or any other kind of prose writing or certain kinds of poetry can do is think about the force of the caption or the force of text as a way of re-describing photographs or influencing the way we encounter the visual, since since a lot of the time we narrativize images, right? And and so, I, it's not that I don't think that there aren't plenty of people who are concerned with that in one way or the other. But again, in the context of that in, interview, when the kind of we're talking about kind of a, a certain kind of mainstream fiction or set of assumptions, I, I don't I don't think a lot of the novelists that I was kind of being asked about. Um, are interested in that. I mean, I think they're they're actually interested in in kind of running contemporary information through 19th century plot structures, you know, and um, so so there's that. I mean, my you know my I, it's not about. I mean, the, but I, there's also maybe concern. I mean, the novel. So the novel for me, um, I mean, the the. The origins of the novel are in this radically experimental, bizarre tradition that includes uh, images. You know, I mean, if you think about Tristram Shandy, it includes Marx and questions about the relation between Marx and other and 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 writing. And you know, Don Quixote. Borges talked about how every novel is a variation on the Quixote. I mean, there's surely, you know, there's there's how in the second half of Don Quixote, Don Quixote encounters the effect of the fiction of the first half being published or whatever. So, for me, it's not that. Um, it's not that I've like read a bunch of novels and I'm ready to pronounce like judgment on the form so much as I think a lot of what passes for fiction isn't very it, it hasn't isn't making a lot of contact with the kind of go for broke formal experiments of the genre as I learned to love it. But I also am weird about this because I came, you know, I didn't ever think I was gonna write. I never thought, I mean, I, insofar as I have an education, I thought of it as actually kind of somehow opposed to the idea that I would ever write fiction. So I've been very surprised by, by what's happened. And I think part of it for me is that I, I'm, one thing I think the novel can do or some other kind of prose can do is it's a very curatorial form for me. Like more and more this is how I, I think, like it can assimilate other genres and it can offer thick descriptions for encounters with works of art, poems, works of visual art that are real or imagined. And I think that, you know, the other novel I've written is also full of talk about poetry and there's a poem at the middle of it. So I, I think of the, the elasticity of the form, which doesn't mean I don't think it has to have a very rigorous architecture, but the way it can assimilate other genres or other media, photographs, poetry, whatever, and, and stage encounters and describe and re-describe those encounters, that to me seems like something prose can do. Thank you. <laughs> um, there are copies of the novel for sale right over there. Do you have some time to sign? Sure. Yes. Okay, yeah. so Ben will be here signing. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for coming.